Hello, welcome, good evening to uh, 211, another week. You made it through week one, congratulations. Most of you had a very good week on the discussion board, which as we've discussed is most all of your points in a class like this. So good on you who have uh, completed all three posts for last week. If you haven't, hurry and get those done. I'll be completing the grading tonight. And as we discussed before, you will not get full credit if it wasn't turned on on time. However, you'll get most of the credit. And uh, to be able to pass a class like this, it, it will require you to do all three, or excuse me, all four of the weeks on the discussion board since that's all the points. So, of course, we've got daily checkpoints. Of course, we got a small quiz in week four. It's not a uh, comprehension quiz, but just some feedback on the course. So don't get nervous about that. Uh, but most of the points, as we discussed before, come from these weekly discussion boards. Last week required three posts. This week, just as a heads up, and I put this on the board already, it requires four posts, a main post, and then three responses. So one additional post more than you are probably used to. So just make sure and catch that in the instructions. We'll talk a little bit more here in a second about what will be required for this week as far as the discussion board. But just as a recap for last week, we talked about personality. This week, we're going to talk about learning styles and how that helps us both as a student, but also in the future as a teacher, as a parent, as a coworker. Uh, we're going to learn about different learning styles and, and how that influences various aspects of our lives. Uh, last week, we talked about personality types. We talked about what helps form our value systems, um, our self-efficacy. We talked about that term, um, you know, that, that calm, quiet confidence that we have in our own ability uh, that's so important to be able to take with us into a workplace environment. Uh, managers can see that from a long ways away. They might not be able to see it in interviews, but once you get working for them or working for a company, they're able to see quite quickly whether or not you have uh, that confidence that comes with just just being sure, not necessarily of everything. You know, and it's not an, an arrogance or a, or an egotism as we talked about. It's not it's not arrogant or egotistical. But what it is is it's a calm assurance or confidence in your own ability to pick something up and to execute on something and do a good job. And that goes a long ways. That attitude of that cool confidence or self-efficacy goes a long ways when it comes to being promoted or getting opportunities within a workplace. So obviously in a, in a course like this where we're really trying to prepare as much as we can, all of you for that next promotion, that next opportunity, that next job, um, whether or not you're in it or ready or not, there's always additional opportunities that could be had and opportunities for growth within a current workplace, if not, you know, a new one. So one of the things that you can do to accomplish that is, is find out the value systems and personality traits that you have that are good, that are positive, like we, like we should have from last week's interview, and then emphasize those and, and, and find career paths and companies and cultures that match and emphasize those things that you are good at, that you are, that you excel at, that you're, that are, that are already positives of your, of yours. If you can match those up and emphasize your, your positive traits, you'll be in a situation where um, you'll get your best opportunity for advancement and promotion and fulfillment. Even if you don't get advancement or promotion or have those opportunities, you'll, you'll get more fulfillment from work. Uh, if you can emphasize those things that, that are important to you, that you value, that you're good at. So that was the personality side of last week. Of course, we covered a couple articles on professionalism, some do's and don'ts list. Um, I hope that you were able to go through those and at least pick one or two, take one or two away that you can uh, implement uh, within your workplace and hopefully will help you once again to have an aura of professionalism that, that also goes a long ways for employers, managers, and coworkers. All right, so that's last week. This week, we're gonna be talking, as I mentioned, about learning types, uh, different learning styles. We're gonna talk about what your learning style is, what, what your most, uh, what, what learning style would help you the most to, to be able to, to comprehend something and to, to get something, grasp something. Uh, as I mentioned before, it will help you with your coursework. It'll help you with your school you know, situation and, and, and learning situation, but it'll also help you as a, as a, in the future as a parent, as a teacher, 
as a coworker, as a colleague, as a manager, anybody who's in a situation where they're trying to communicate and educate. When I teach business communication classes, we talk about the, the emphasis or whether or not when we're trying to determine whether or not we're successful as a communicator, the bottom line is, did we come to an understanding? Were we able to get the, our audience to, to understand something as far as our concept? Is it memorable? And are they going to do something about it? So all three of those things, if we understand people's learning styles, that will help us to be able to more effectively communicate and accomplish those key objectives of effective and successful business communication. And once again, those are your ability to communicate in a way that helps somebody understand the concept, remember the concept, and then finally be motivated to make a change or do something about what it is that they're understanding. Okay, so in the, in the, in the context of a, of a business meeting at work, you bring your team together in the morning, you're the manager, you're the supervisor, the boss's boss or the ownership has come, they've emailed you something about, you know, some kind of professionalism issue that needs to be taken care of within your workplace. So you could, you could just read that communication, right, to your team and break, you know, move on because you don't want to, you know, rub everybody wrong and be that manager that's always harping on different things. Or you could take that communication and make sure that, again, as a, as a communicator, you are going to, to make sure and connect with, you, with your audience, connect with your team in a way that they understand, is memorable, and motivating. And if you can do those three things every time that you're trying to communicate with others, especially in a workplace environment, and do it in obviously a positive way, so it's not uh, patronizing or mean or, or uh, you know, it doesn't come across militaristic in any way. You know, we've all had managers like that. We don't like them. Uh, we want managers who care and connect and motivate, right? And, uh, and those are things that you can do every single time that you communicate. Sometimes it's easier than other times. And some audiences are easier to, to accomplish that with than other audiences, as you can imagine. But it is something that we can accomplish as a skill set or improve as a skill set over time as well. So something worth considering. Obviously, all of you either have already had business communication classes or will in the future. But I wanted to tie that business communication theme into what we're learning about today, which is learning. And as I mentioned before, learning styles. Now, some of you might have already gone through some of the required reading for this week. There are a couple different articles. There's a TEDx talk about reading, about, excuse me, about learning. And then I have posted uh, a, a, a brief article tonight. Um, it's, it's actually not an article. It's a video link in, within the slides tonight that takes a different perspective on learning styles as well and, and how to teach different learning styles that I thought was interesting. We'll talk about a little bit here at the end. But we'll go over some of the material tonight, as we always do. We'll review some of the, the high points and, and key points, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Of course, still expect you to re read the required readings and watch the required videos. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some different aspects of learning styles and, and how you and I can accomplish this week's assignment as far as the discussion board as it pertains to learning styles and also how those things can then apply to our lives and, and hopefully help us out going forward, right? We, we don't want a class like this to be something where we just jump through the hoop and don't take anything with us. We're paying too much and putting in too much effort to not take something with us and, and have it, you know, be impactful and hopefully helpful for the rest of our lives. All right, so we've got different learning styles. So just as an overview, who cares why? Why are we even talking about different learning styles? Why does it even matter? So especially when it comes to our careers, right? When, when, when we're done with our education, why does it even matter that we've talked about learning styles or that we've thought through and understand different learning styles? I've already alluded to the uh, significant part of why I think it's important, which is that if you understand people's learning styles, you understand your audience, you're better able to connect with your audience as a communicator. And when it comes to business, when it comes to opportunity, Within your career, within your workplace, business communication is perhaps the most important part of opportunity going forward when it comes to your career. So, as to be an effective communicator, we need to understand our audience. It's one of the key, you know, uh, foundational 
points of effective business communication. We have to understand your audience. And if you understand your audience, you're able to better uh, connect with them and help them understand, motivate, and change like we talked about before as the, as the key success elements or, or ways that you can evaluate whether or not you were successful in, in whatever you were communicating. That same thing can be held true, though, for parenting, for uh, colleagues at work. It doesn't have to be a, a manager you know, to employee or supervisor to team type communication. It can just be colleague to colleague. It can be peer to peer. It can be friend to friend. It can be parent to child. Uh, all those types of communication require, if we want to be highly effective at it, uh, an understanding of our audience. And a learning style or a learning type uh, that's significantly different one person from another can dictate that we should then cater our communication or tailor our communication a little bit differently based on their specific learning style. An easy way to think about this is, is with, uh, it, with your children, if you have children. Most children have a little bit different way of learning. They're, they're unique, right? One of them might be, you know, someone that you can tell a list of things to do and they'll go do them and, and uh, accomplish it without any problem. Then you might have another child that if you gave them a list of things to do verbally, they would never be able to accomplish it because th that, that's not how their brain works. They don't, they're not able to retain something that they hear orally. Uh, however, um, they might be somebody who works very effectively off a checklist, right? To keep them organized and keep them on task. So, so we, we can see that, you know, those differences, those nuances in our own children. Sometimes we don't think about that in terms of business communication. Sometimes we don't think about that when we're trying to be self-aware. Again, this concept of self-awareness, us knowing, okay, you and I knowing how we most effectively learn can then help us understand how we should learn uh, as students, okay? And the quiz this week, the, the quiz that tries to help determine what type of learner we are, also does an effective job of giving us feedback on how to then use that information to become a more effective student, okay? And so we'll look at that here in a second if we have, if we have a few minutes. I've taken the quiz for myself and uh, thought we might show you some of the feedback that it gave me and uh, talk through how we might be able to utilize that feedback. And if we're able to get that feedback from the quiz, that also will help us. This week's assignment, creating two PowerPoint presentation slides and putting at least 50 uh, speaker notes in those slides uh, about both the quiz, what learning type we are, and then also how we then can use that learning type to better you know, to be a better student, to be, to have more success as a student at the school. Uh, those two slides, we can take, we can derive almost all of our material from the quiz link on this week's uh, required reading. And then after the, we take the quiz, like I say, there'll be some feedback and, and we'll, uh, we'll give you that feedback here in just a second, or at least an example of it. So finding out your learning style is pretty easy. There's lots of different quizzes out there. Some of the different quizzes are focused on different types of learning styles, and that's why I put this three, four, seven. There are commonly either three, four, or seven learning types. Uh, some folks have more, some folks, you know, but most folks don't boil it down to any less than three as far as academia when they refer to different learning styles. Usually it's a minimum of three. And then the, the, there's one of the articles that we're reading this week that will show seven different uh, iterations of learning styles. And some of them are very similar. Um, like I say, when, when, usually when they really boil it down to, to the basics, you've got three different types. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. But, but just know that there's some disagreement on how many learning styles there are. And, um, and that's okay, right? Academia always disagrees because they've got smart people who – um, find it hard to agree with other people, find it hard to be agreeable because they're so smart and come up with their own ideas. And so we have some disagreement and that's okay. It's, it's interesting to think about why those folks would have different opinions on, on learning styles and to look at the different ones and for you and I to decide, okay, is it, is it helpful to me to have these different iterations that are, that are you know, that there are more uh, different types of learning styles, or does it make sense just to, to boil it down to the three or four, you know, basic ones that you commonly will come across? 
one of the notes that I had for tonight to just, just think about is, can I control my learning style? Can I become better at a learning style? Can I dictate which learning style becomes my most effective learning style? And I think there's some disagreement in academia about how much control you have, but I think there is agreement generally that you have one type that you might be more prone to, but that that potentially could change based on life experience or based on practice, you know, with a certain type of learning style. So just, just know that, that uh, yes, you have some control over what types of learning, you know, styles you excel at and you can improve your skill sets in one or more of these learning types. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, we, if we know which learning type we're most effective at, that might help us to focus on that learning style uh, to more effectively learn and be a better student. All right, so um, we talked about uh, a little bit earlier, at least alluded to this most effective, uh, the idea of most effective communication. The most effective communication for somebody with a learning style, that's a certain type, is to cater to that learning style, right? If we've got an auditory learner, we want to be talking and they want to, we want to be able to have them hear something. Uh, if we're if we're dealing with a visual learner, we want to make sure and have charts and 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 graphs and things that they can see, images that that uh, will help them to remember and learn the concept that we're trying to teach. And if we're teaching somebody that's more tactile or what's referred to as kinesthetic, uh, as far as a, a kinesthetic learner, those folks will will learn most effectively by having their hands in something or on something or doing something as they learn. Now, as I mentioned before, there's some different iterations, but those are the three basic categories of learning styles. And when we talk about most effective communication, usually we're talking about catering to the effective, the most effective learning style of our audience. Now, having said that, uh, one of the things that an article, or excuse me, a video that, that uh, is, a, is a PBS video, um, through the Smithsonian, so it's it's it, you know it's got some legitimate um, academic feedback going into it, uh, even though it's kind of a childish video. It's it's trying to make the information simple, right? Uh, and so it's a kind of a silly video, but the information I think is very helpful to think about the fact that as a teacher, it doesn't make sense as a teacher to have a classroom of, of, of kids, right? And think, okay, two thirds of these folks are visual learners, maybe one quarter of them are auditory learners, and maybe, you know, 10, 15% are kinesthetic learners. Well, if I know that starting the year, and I try to make every single lesson touch all three of those learning styles, I might uh, be a less effective teacher. I might be in a situation where I might, um, uh, create boredom with the other learners, you know, while I'm trying to cater to different groups. Uh, I might not be able to connect, you know, the way that I had hoped in the amount of time in the most efficient way possible. And the flip side is if I don't include all three at different times when I'm teaching different material, then I might lose people as well. And so and people might say, well, okay, so if two thirds of my class are visual learners, then Maybe I should just focus on visual learners and focus my material and, and how I teach on visual learning. But there's a lot of material and statistics that show the most effective type of teaching actually does include all three types. And so even somebody who's a visual learner, so let's say I'm, I'm primarily a visual learner, which I am, it doesn't mean that if you combine auditory and kinesthetic, you know, something that I actually do and feel and touch and, and actual try, actually try, and visual all three that I won't actually learn the best. So there's a lot of material out there that, that basically states, hey, in, in science, for example, if you can get people to try a science experiment, see a science experiment, and hear about a science experiment, that's, that's the very best way that, that the average person will learn is to have all three of those things happening uh, in their experience, in their learning experience. And I think most of the, the, the colleges and schools that I've been around or, or, or taught at or been at different meetings with, most of them have kind of bought off on this idea that, that yes, people learn in different ways and have different, you know, ways that maybe they're, that they need to focus on for themselves to learn better. But as a teacher or professor, our job is to make sure and touch all three of those as often as we possibly can. 
to make sure that folks have the opportunity to see what we're talking about, that they hear what we're talking about, and then that they actually can try, you know, to do whatever it is that we're, that we're to talking about as well, okay? And uh, as I mentioned before, under the topic of control, can you change? And, the, and, and I think the answer in most academia agrees is, is yes. That, uh, you know, might not, but life experience, as I mentioned before, you know, practice in a different, in a, in a learning style over time can help make you a little bit more proficient or dominant in one learning type or style uh, that maybe you weren't so much uh, so that way in the past. Most people will stay pretty consistent, but I, I, I guess I'm just pointing out that there are, there is room for change, you know, when it comes to your dominant learning style. All right, so here are the three main types. Let me just share really quick, as I mentioned I would, my feedback because I think it's really helpful. Okay, so in this particular quiz, interestingly enough, I was a kinesthetic learner primarily. And it's actually one of the first times I've ever taken a quiz about learning types that I haven't been dominant with visual learning styles. So that, first of all, I thought that was kind of interesting. This, this quiz kind of gave me a different, uh, different feedback than I get on a lot of the quizzes that I take. So here's the link to the quiz that we are taking this week. It's going to give you your, your learning type, right, after asking, answering some questions. Try to be as honest and, and uh, you know, thoughtful as you can about the answers that you give. And I think the feedback will be more helpful uh, the, the more that's the case. So the uh, so what we've what we've talked about here is uh, or what we've done, excuse me, is I've I've taken this quiz. It's giving me my learning type, and then it gives me some feedback on how to utilize that information. Right? Why does this matter? Why do I care? Well, why does it matter? Why do I care? Here are the ways that I take in information. I use all my senses, at least in this particular quiz. That's, that's, what, they, uh, that, that's what a kinesthetic learner does. They, they use all their senses and they, they want to have, you know, touch, taste, smell, hearing, sight, you know, all those things together. They, we, we like laboratory environments where we get to actually feel and touch and, and do something. We like field trips, tours, we like examples. We like lecturers who give real life examples and applications. We like them to get to the point, right? Instead of going, you know, around the point, you know, when it comes to a lecture, we want something to get right to uh, the gist of what, of, of what the real core is. Uh, we like exhibits, examples, photographs. We, we, so, so anyway, it goes through all these things. And I think, you know, if you, if you were to score high on, on the kinesthetic learner, you're probably saying, yeah, that's exactly what I, what I like. And then some other people who don't score, score as high on it will say, well, I like that too. You know, I mean, we, we, this kind of goes back to how most of us maybe have a dominant area or learning type, but we, we all benefit when more types, uh, you know, or methods of teaching uh, or learning styles are catered to, you know, when, when there's a mixture. And then SWOT, Study Without Tears, uh, is their little uh, acronym for Study Without Tears. How do you study without tears? How do you have less anxiety and problems and struggles with your studies as a student? Well, here gives you a list of different things that you can do, basically some tips on ways that as a kinesthetic learner, and it will do this with every single learning type, that you might want to jot some of these down because these are ways that will help you to be a better student with your dominant learning type. So if, if I'm a kinesthetic learner, I want to convert my notes into learnable packages. I want, I want to reduce them down. I want to take a lot of material and make sure and get right down to the, to the basics with my notes. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to have things that I can remember based on a story or, or something real or relevant or concrete. Uh, I want lots of examples. Um, Anyway, there's just different things here that I think are really good, you know, recall, 
recall and, and recount different things. Go back to a laboratory or lab to, to practice something. Use pictures uh, to illustrate ideas. Talk about with talk about you know whatever it is that you're studying with another person that's a kinesthetic learner. Uh, that'll be effective study time for both of you. Uh, anyway, there's some just some different great tips on how some suggestions on how you can be a better student if you're a kinesthetic learner. And obviously, each one of the learning types has its own set of unique tips uh, for folks who find themselves in that category. As far as the output, um, it, it says write practice answers and paragraphs, role play the exam situation in your own room. So if I'm going to be taking a test, a good way for me to study for a test is to role play the exam situation Make sure I've, I've visualized it. Make sure I've, I've gone through and written, actually handwritten practice answers, paragraphs, uh, so that I've had that practice doing. Again, as a kinesthetic learner, it's about doing. And so uh, that's why those tend to help quite a bit. Okay. So anyway, just wanted to show you that. I think it's a helpful, um, I think it's a very helpful quiz, and I think it's some very helpful feedback. Uh, we've got two different, basically, lists of or, or outlines, two different websites that outline different learning types, different ways of thinking about it, different names of some of them. And so those are some pretty good articles to, to consider as well. Then there's the TEDx talk that we talked about that, that I mentioned. Great talk. You need to give yourself, I think, about 20 minutes. Yeah, it's 18 minutes and 50 seconds. So we want to make sure that you give yourself enough time so that you can see that whole uh, video. The video is an interesting video. It actually doesn't spend as much time talking about the different learning types or learning styles like the other websites and required readings do. But the TEDx talk is a, is a great talk. Uh, uh, a gal who, who, who talks about people are not able to people who have a hard time learning basically can train themselves and train their brains to process information better. Okay. So not really about learning styles, but definitely a big help for folks who struggle when it comes to comprehending, learning, retaining information and focusing. And I think there are a lot of us who at different times in our lives and, and maybe even right now, you know, in this class struggle with the ability to concentrate, focus, retain information and understand information as it's presented to us in a class like this and, and maybe just in life in general. So what do we do about that? Well, this is a TEDx talk that goes into great detail about how we can help our brains. Okay. We can actually condition our brains and help exercise our brains in ways that help us to be able to focus and basically and how it applies to the learning styles that we're learning about in this particular class is they grouped this 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 research group grouped people into three different learning styles right the, the auditory the visual and the kinesthetic or the or the in the what we've referred to as tactile here on the slide and what they did is they basically said, can we categorize some different experiments, some different exercises for the brain into these three categories and work on all three in order to help students, in order to help individuals condition their brain to better learn, to be able to, once again, focus, retain information, and perform, you know, in, in, a, in a classroom environment. And the statistics as far as the feedback when they did these interventions with different students at different grade levels was significant, meaning their exercises to try to make people better at these different learning styles actually were highly effective in not changing the person overnight to become a phenomenal student, but to make material gains in their ability to once again, focus, concentrate, uh, take care of assignments, follow through, retain information, score on tests, those kinds of things that basically make up our, our traditional classroom environment. And, and her comment early on in this video that I think is very interesting talks about how most of us can look at a picture, an image, and that's a concrete piece of information that, that we can then talk about. But many of us have a hard time with words, 
with uh, paragraphs, with thoughts, with uh, things that are more abstract. And the more abstract that information gets, the harder it is for us to, to comprehend, to process in our mind. And so when you get to things like math, for example, a lot of people struggle with math. Math becomes really abstract for most of us. And it's a challenge for many people to learn math and to comprehend math and then to retain it and, and do a good job in it because of this concept of, of folks not being able to, to focus, uh, you know, retain that information and then be able to use and process it. So once again, they, they took these, these study groups, they did interventions with these different students, practicing and, and not even taking a lot of time, but just doing little practices little exercises, excuse me, that help their brain to better be able to concentrate, focus, retain information, and so forth. And, and I thought it was fascinating. I think it's, um, it's probably the same concept as, as some of these companies that market themselves. There's a company here locally that I hear on the radio called Brain Balance, and basically their pitch, and I don't know what the company actually does, but their pitch is that they help people, they help specifically students, younger people, to be able to focus better in school, to be able to perform better in school and do better in their schoolwork. My guess is it's some kind of exercises similar to what we're hearing in this TEDx talk this week about trying to condition the brain and exercise the muscles in the brain to be able to uh, focus, like I say, retain information and, and uh, process that information and understand. So anyway, a fascinating talk. Uh, interesting, like I say, that we can that we can exercise our brain in ways to then be able to be a better student, uh, to focus better, to understand, and to retain information. So I thought it was an I thought it was a fun uh, TEDx talk. I really like TEDx talks, though. Anyway, most of them are fascinating. This one has a lot to do with though what we're talking about, right? Many of us will say, okay, out of these three learning types. I am primarily a visual learner or a tactile learner or auditory learner. So great. You know, I've got some tips from this website, from this quiz that gives, gives me some feedback on how maybe I can, I can help myself, you know, to be able to do better on tests, to be able to understand better in a class, but I still struggle. And if that's your response, I still struggle. There may be resources out there and, and even just free resources. If you, if you look for them, that could help you to exercise, if you're willing to put in the effort and time, could help you to exercise um, the different muscles in your brain to be able to better comprehend and focus. And, and even if it's just a marginal improvement, I think that's well worth the investment of time and energy in something like that to, to help you out and to, to make school a little bit less stressful and, and, and hard for for some, for some people, for other people, school comes very naturally. You know, we look around and there's some folks who take classes. It's very easy for them to memorize. It's very easy them for them to retain and understand and focus, you know, on, on what it is that they're learning. They can hear something once it feels like that they, you know, have it down from that point on. But I think most of us, it's not that easy, right? There, and then there's different stages of, of folks who, you know, or it's, it's, you know, they have to work at it, but they can get it. And then there are folks who work really, really hard and it feels like they can never, you know, kind of break through and, and really understand concepts and, and get different things that they're trying to learn. And like I say, for that, for, for all of us, wherever we are on that, on that pendulum, wherever we are on that spectrum of learning and, 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 and how good we are at learning, I think we can all make a marginal step in the right direction by maybe practicing some of the things that this TEDx talk refers to. Um, I was going to have you, if you, if anybody was live tonight to do one of the experiments that she has her crowd do during the video. And so if you're listening to this as a recorded session, I would encourage you to stand up. This is kind of strange. Stand up, close your eyes. Okay. Lift your right leg just a little bit so that your foot is off the ground and just balance yourself for five seconds. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Okay, you're done. Now, the, one of the brain exercises that she does with students is, is just what you did. Closing your eyes. Now, it's important to close your eyes. I was practicing this uh, you know, before this class. And if you, op if you keep your eyes open, it's for whatever reason, it's a lot easier to balance on one foot. 
when you close your eyes, it's a little more difficult. And what she does is, is initially a lot of people struggle to keep their balance, even for five seconds. They, you know, they have to kind of tap their foot to keep themselves up. Um, but then as they practice this over and over again, they start to get uh, a better balance and, the, and they're able to, uh, you know, get up to 20 or 30 seconds without any problem, without ever having to tap their foot down to help them balance. And this is just one of the exercises. The point of this particular exercise is to help the brain communicate back and forth from the right and left side of your brain. So in order to really learn effectively, we need both sides of our brain, right? And this exercise using doing both the right foot and the left foot helps your, your brain to fire back and forth between and communicate back and forth between the left and the right side. So just a really simple exercise, but one of these weird little simple exercises that this group does to help people exercise their brain power and, and like a muscle, you know, that exercise their abilities with their brain. Another one is, is, you know, and, and she shows pictures of this. It's just this dot chart, right? Where there are lines between the dots and she, you know, you can look at this chart and she just wants you to recreate it yourself on a piece of paper. Well, initially, some people, even with very simple images, have a very difficult time, you know, or, or, you know, just very simple shapes have a very difficult time recreating them. But as time goes on, as we practice, even as the, even as these um, diagrams become more and more complicated, we get better and better and better, and we're training our brain to get better and better at it. And uh, that's visual recognition. That's a visual exercise, being able to to concentrate on something and then then remember what it is you know to to that we're that we're looking at and focus on it and then finally another exercise that she talks about that's just one of I'm sure a handful of other things that they do is to have somebody concentrate on on something you're saying to them at the same time that they that they walk or at the same time that they tap their head uh, doing something physically and doing something mentally at the same time allows them to overcome some distraction. And she talks about how classroom environments rarely don't have distraction. So usually there's somebody who's acting out. Usually there's somebody who's having problems. Usually there's some kind of, of, of there's something for us to be distracted by. And one of the things that we need to exercise our brain at is being able to focus on something in spite of uh, different uh, distractions. And I, and I, again, just, I, I think it's just fascinating that you can practice this because I think all of those things that we just really talked about, those different exercises would be great, uh, you know, for, for your left side, right side of your brain to always be communicating at a high level for you to be able to concentrate on things without distractions, for you to be able to, uh, be able to focus in on something and quickly be able to, to, uh, recreate it in your mind. Uh, if you can do those things, it, I, I just feel like there'd be so many other applications beyond just schoolwork, right, that we can focus on and do better at. And one of the things that they do studies, they did a study on is that they, juvenile delinquents who end up in, in juvenile court have a really difficult time in these three areas that we just mentioned, her three main learning style boxes. And if they can help those folks improve, they, you know, they can help those, those kids to feel more confident about, you know, their ability to learn. And those kids feel less of a drive or less of a pull to, to commit crime and to, to do things that they shouldn't. A lot of those kids are acting out because they really struggle to focus and to excel at uh, any kind of coursework or even a job, right? They, 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 they struggle with, with the ability to focus and understand in a work environment even. And because work environment, school environments don't work for them, they end up, uh, you know, in a situation where they get in trouble. So I thought that was also an interesting part of the TEDx talk, talking about juvenile folks who end up in juvenile court can can help themselves avoid recidivism, which is very high among juveniles when they've gone to when they've gone to court or when they've gone to a juvenile detention center. It's very likely it's about an 85 percent recidivism, which means an 85 percent chance that, it, that they're going to end up back in juvenile court. Well, if you can break that cycle by helping them to be able to learn and to, to effectively learn, focus, retain information, uh, and read and enjoy learning. Uh, you know, the point, uh, one of the main points I got, I took away from this talk is that, that we can stop 
some of that, uh, that youth crime that, that occurs. Anyway, so a lot of different interesting points from that TEDx talk. I, I just wanted to point out a few, but I think it's a, I think it's a fun talk. I think it's an interesting exercise. It makes me want to go find some more of these exercises and actually do them myself to, to try to improve. I think it's a small investment that, that could have large dividends if we can somehow, you know, focus better, retain information better, and, uh, and be able to learn, you know, more effectively. So anyway, those are the three main categories. That's the TEDx talk. Uh, that's that information. So let's talk a little bit about workplace application for a minute. Um, oh, real quick before I forget. On the bottom of each uh, PowerPoint slide, there's always a place to put in speaker notes. So every time I teach this class, I'll have a few people who say, well, I don't, I don't really understand the instructions when it says, put up to 50 words, you know, make sure you have at least 50 words in the speaker notes within your PowerPoint, because I don't even know what the speaker notes are. It's just the notes part at the bottom of the page of each one of the slides. Every single slide has, um, every single slide, you know, that you're creating with it within PowerPoint will have a notes bar on the bottom. And if you just go to the scroll to the bottom of the slide, then you can enter in that information. You can enter in at least 50 words regarding the slide, regarding the information the instructions call for. So slide one's gonna be about your learning style. That's just based on the quiz. What, what's your learning style? What's the feedback about your learning style? That's your first page. Your feedback, your opinions about whether or not the quiz is right or wrong. Maybe you take another quiz somewhere different online to get some ad an additional opinion or some additional feedback. The second page that you're creating, the second PowerPoint page and the 50 words that you need to create and the speaker notes on the second page is about the feedback that the quiz gives you on how that, uh, how knowing your learning style can now help you to become a better student. And try to take this seriously. I mean, if you look through some of those, those uh, tips like I did with you on my feedback, you know, some of those tips are really, you know, can be really uh, helpful. Uh, you know, role playing, uh, doing different things as a kinesthetic learner can can help you more effectively study instead of just trying to take the old approach where, well, I'm just like everybody else. And for some reason, when I read a textbook, it doesn't make much sense and I just don't get it. Well, you might it might not make sense and you just don't get it because you might not be uh, a, a reading learner. You might not be a, a visual learner. You know, those bars and you know, those charts and graphs that you get from a, from a textbook, you know, and just reading through the textbook might not help you at all. You may need to, to, you know, really hone in on, on just the main points. You may need to make sure your notes just concentrate on the main points and relevant stories and examples. And then, like I say, do some role playing and other things. If you're a kinesthetic learner, those things might help you to more effectively study and retain that information and actually learn it. So, uh, so that's the assignment for this week as far as the discussion board is concerned. Two-page PowerPoint, at least 50 words within the speaker notes on each of the slides as well as the slides, right? So don't just put 50 words onto a slide. That's not what it's asking for. Create a fun slide, you know, within PowerPoint. Doesn't I'm not going to dock you for not being able to make something fancy with PowerPoint. I'm not very good at PowerPoint. Um, but I do want, you know, just something that's visually appealing for the PowerPoint slide and then you know, 50 words to describe, you know, what it is that you, that, that the instructions are calling for, for that particular slide. And we've just discussed, there are two slides and they each have their own instructions. All right. So now we get to this slide, uh, the workplace application. So we've talked about how we want, you know, this learning style and this, this, you know, your dominant learning style to help now you to be able to be a better student. But we also want to be very careful that obviously we take away something even beyond our college education, you know, from a class like this, hopefully, uh, something meaningful and impactful and something that can, that can help us even in the workplace. And we've alluded a little bit to different ways that you know, effective business communication within the workplace is so critical and that knowing your learning style, knowing other people's learning styles can help you to become a more effective communicator. It can help you connect, which is a key part of business communication, connection and connecting. Um, if you connect, you have influence. If you have influence, you can help somebody remember and motivate. 
uh, to do something different. And, and that's, like I say, the point, and we've, we've talked about that already. But one of the other issues is that there are many workplaces now that are very curious. In fact, a very, a very common interview question now is to ask you, how is it that you in your past workplaces have continued learning? So let's say you go work for Walmart. How did you continue learning even after being at that job for a while? And why do they ask a question like that? They ask a question like that because they want people who are willing to change and willing to learn on the job. The, the, the thing that's consistent about most jobs is that they change, <laughs> right? The, the job description changed a little bit over time. The material, the information, how we interact with clients, how we interact with software potentially will change over time. And, and a person's ability to, to cope with those changes, to roll with those changes, to, to excel because of change uh, is critical. And, and so a lot of interviewers are honing in on that. And, and basically the idea is, are you going to be willing to adapt and change within this work environment? And I would propose that understanding how you learn and then being willing and committed to always learning, even, even within a workplace to learn, you know, education is not over. Once you've got your degree, you're going to be learning even more, you know, than you did during your degree. Once you're in that workplace, in that career, you're getting you know, what we call experience, but that's learning, right? And you want to be able to adapt and to change and to expand your capacity and opportunities based on your ability to learn. So is it important to understand how you learn best? Yes, even in a workplace, because you'll want to emphasize, again, strengths. And if you learn a certain way, we want you to be able to, to emphasize that particular learning area and in the same way we did when we got the quiz feedback about being a better student, we can get that same quiz feedback and say, okay, this is how it would help me to be a better employee within my career. Okay. If I am a visual learner, study the charts, study the numbers, study the information. If I'm an auditory learner, have somebody tell me the information, ask questions, ask a lot of questions and be carefully listening all the time for, for new information. And if I'm a kinesthetic learner, I'm going to try things. I'm going to, I'm going to look at other examples. I'm going to ask for other examples and information from other people. I'm going to role play. I'm going to, I'm going to practice, you know, even at home, you know, different scenarios uh, so that I can get better at what it is that I do for my, for my job. So, so all these things should apply, uh, very effectively to a workplace environment if you'll let them, if you'll effort them. And then just know that we can improve them, right? We talked about how we can improve, we can control some of it, um, you know, and, and because we can control and improve, we, we, we should, we should always be striving to accomplish that. And then uh, I put in the note communication needs that this, this is, this is important because um, if we're really trying to learn within a workplace, we need to be willing, okay, we need to be willing both with our colleagues and our boss and our supervisor to ask for help, to ask for advice. You know, a lot of people are anxious to ask for advice or anxious to ask for help because they don't want to seem like they don't know what they're talking about or what they're doing. And reality is managers, supervisors, most often, if it's done right, if it's not pestersome, if it's not bothersome, if it's not too much, they will appreciate, they will really appreciate the opportunity to help coach and train and mentor, you know, employees and, and for you to ask them for advice, to ask them for help. That will be uh, uh, both flattering to a supervisor or manager, but also helpful to you, right? To really find out what it is that they're focused on so that you can make sure and be successful as their employee or as somebody on their team to accomplish exactly what it is that they want most. Right. And so one of the things that some of the articles talk about is that within a workplace, you need to be secure enough with yourself to go to a manager and say, this is how I learn. This is the type of learner I am. This is how I learn best. And this is how I, uh, you know, grow within a work environment and do my best. And so that the manager then can understand your unique learning style. And believe me, if they're a good manager, they'll try to cater to that. They'll try to help you and make sure to, to learn the very best way you can. And, and anybody on a team who's willing 
to approach a supervisor or manager with this information. Hey, this is how I learn. This is how I learn best. This is how I really would appreciate to get information within the workplace, you know, so that I can do my best job so that I can be the best employee. Um, they'll be flattered by that. They'll want to accommodate you and help you the very best to succeed because you were willing to communicate your, you know, your unique uh, learning style. Um, and, and like I say, the better we can communicate those things with an employer or a manager, the better they'll be suited to be able to help us uh, to be successful. Okay. And like I say, they'll be flattered that somebody's anxious to be better and to improve and to, and to more effectively operate within their team. Okay. So don't be intimidated to do that. Make sure, uh, and at some point, you know, in your relationship with your manager or supervisor that you have that conversation, even if it's just in your business review, you know, you don't go out of your way to do it, but in a business review setting, which most every business has business reviews now, a supervisor or manager is going to sit down with you once a month, once a quarter, once a week, once a year, uh, no matter how often it is, and they're going to sit down with you and they're going to talk about what work, what's working, what's not working, how you can improve, and that's a great opportunity to bring up, this is how I learn, this is how I function, this is, this is me, right? This is the way that I work. And if, and if, uh, and, and this is how I can be an, a very effective employee is if I get communication in a certain way, if I operate in a certain way. And I think you'll be surprised at how accommodative some managers and supervisors, not all, but some managers and supervisors will try to be if we open up like that and try to try to get help that way. Okay. All right, now finally, we talked a little bit about how uh, I had a Smithsonian, uh, you know, a, a little video. It's kind of a, a just a cartoon video, but it, it talks about learning styles, and it just tries to make it kind of silly. The idea being that if you're a teacher and you're trying to focus or hone in on learning styles and you're just laser focused on it for your classroom, you might be missing the point of learning types. Um, learning styles might be highly effective on a in a on a one on one basis, and they also might be more effective to you to, to to understand that everybody learns a little bit differently. But most everybody learns most effectively when all of the different learning methods are combined, right? So it's kind of taking on the myth that we need to focus on one learning style, or we need to to make sure and be aware of all the learning styles of our class. That's that's, the, that's maybe too much for a teacher, especially a teacher who's got 30 or 50 students, right, for them to be able to focus on. However, it's important for teachers and folks who are, are, are educating to be aware of these learning styles, if just to make sure that when they're communicating something in a classroom setting, that they use all those different learning styles in the way that they communicate and knowing that no matter which is the dominant way that somebody learns, they'll all more effectively learn if all those learning styles are, are implemented, are, are utilized. And so that's the point of the quick video. Uh, it's not required reading for this week, but I did want to give you a little bit different feedback. It's kind of academics kind of poking fun at other academics, which is always kind of fun. Um, you know, and basically saying we're, we're getting so caught up in learning styles that maybe we're missing the whole point, which is not that we need to cater necessarily to one learning style over another or try to do everything um, in, in a day, but, but maybe more importantly to just make sure that we're touching on all those different learning styles in a normal way that we teach. So that when we teach something in science, we teach, you know, by showing them, we teach by them hearing about it, and then we teach by, you know, actually you know, doing the lab work, right, and and performing the 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 uh, experiment, you know, or feeling the the different types of rock formations and things like that. So so there are different ways that we can that we can implement, um, you know, our teaching style to 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 make sure and emphasize all the different learning styles, but not get so worried about each one or focusing in on one for particular students that we miss the idea or the or the 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 most important part, which is to just be effective teacher overall, we need to utilize all of them. And everybody, no matter what their learning style is, will learn better if all three of the main learning styles are utilized within teaching. 
Okay. All right. So that is uh, what we'll wrap up on tonight. If we'd have had a few people here tonight, we'd have had a little more interaction. We're ending a little bit early this evening. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed the session. Hopefully you have a great week and are successful on the board this week with the discussion board. If you have any questions, let me know. I've already posted for this week about the learning coach and her information. Natalie is available. And especially if you get in touch with her early in the week, she's happy to, to help with anything that you might need some extra help on. And then I'll have grading done by tomorrow um, as far as your week one discussion. So if you have any questions as you review my feedback, as you review your, review your score, make sure and touch base with me. And then as I mentioned before, if, you, if any of you find yourself behind at this point, don't give up. Don't, don't be discouraged. Uh, just make sure and get your work done as soon as you possibly can for most of the credit. Okay. Have a great week and good night.